So good morning, everybody. Um, just a quick audio visual check. Can everybody hear my voice? And can everybody see, um, see my screen, uh, see the screen, please? That'd be just give me an indication. Terrific, thank you very much. So that, that's always a good start, the technology's working. <laughs> Lovely. So good morning, who have we got in the room? We have at the moment, we've had about six, I was expecting a few more, but I've no doubt they'll join us on the way through. Excuse me while I just recover my um, participants list. Um, so the uh, normal rules apply. Um, if you would like to, um, let me just get my participant list back here. If you would like to uh, ask questions, uh, please do. I'll try and break up a little bit more on this occasion for questions um, as we go through. But first of all, welcome to Transforming Leaders, the second workshop, Strategic Thinking for Transformation. Just some, some simple rules of engagement, and that is, if you've got a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, a glass of water is always useful. Have you got a means of taking notes? Um, switch your phone off, he says, just checking his. Yes, switch your phone off. And um, let's just talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. And what we're going to talk um, about today is um, really, um, I'll just put some context around the workshop, so I always do what I'm talking about, why it's important, and what you can hope to achieve. If you've been to my previous workshop last week, you might recognize some of this, it's not all the same, but there is a little bit that's common. Then I'll talk about some content around strategic thinking. And in closing, I'll just let you know very briefly, this is, I, I always say this, this is, this is not a sales webinar, uh, but I'll let you know about a new mentoring program I've got and about the rest of the LinkedIn workshop series on transforming leaders that are coming up. Um, you can ask questions in the chat box uh, all the way through and there'll be time at the end as well. Um, the workshop is being recorded and there'll be a copy. Uh, I'll send a copy through to you. Um, it eventually will go up on website, but I'll make sure you get a link to a copy along with the, uh, along with the slides over the next couple of days. So it records in the crowd. And the other thing which I have forgot to do, which I must do now, is we are going to go live onto Facebook. Uh, so hold on just a moment. So if you will give me just a second. All the wonders of technology. There we go. And Mental note to do this before I start next time. <laughs> I always forget how long it takes. And we are live uh, on Facebook too. So, transforming leaders, trans strategic thinking for transformation, what is um, this all about? Well, the first thing uh, to say, of course, is that um, why this message? I mean, everybody's going on about this and we know the world has changed. We know the singularity that we're in at the moment. But the world is always changing, uh, and that, that's life. Um, it has got a bit harder recently, uh, certainly in, in my business of education. Um, and uh, you've got a singular event somewhere leading to this uh, catastrophic pandemic. Um, it really is, um, I've said this before, classic complexity theory. Probably a single portion of that stew, probably consumed by one leads to who statistics, um, which are enormous. I'm not going to repeat them. Um, I've said them often enough. So we've got this singularity that's a tipping point um, with health, political, economic, social and technological impacts, and it's driving change. Now that requires a change in strategy, be it in your own approach to leadership, your own business, or indeed your own life or whatever it is you wish to do. And, and transforming strategy, requires critical and systematic thinking. Now, the important thing is, is that very often 
critical thinking decision making is is presented by uh, some authorities some of them with Nobel prizes as being this hugely logical um, clearly uh, very carefully thought through um, objective approach to things and I've been teaching vari variations on the theme of decision making and strategic thinking for nearly 30 years now and I'm here to tell you that it's got subjectivity in it because at some point somebody has to make a decision when it comes to strategic thinking and that's complex because it's informed by all of the things that are going on in your head and everybody's head is different we've all got different mental models for life um, so it, it's really what I'm talking about is it's the it's the gap between analysis and decision making and for some people it, that's the gap that's the point at which the magic happens and the, and the question around why I'm doing this session on strategic thinking and other sessions I'll do later is would you like more magic because that's the opportunity is to create a little more magic through um, thinking more clearly why the message now and some of you will have seen this chart before uh, that and just very briefly I'm not going to go on about this uh, much but we're in a disruption disruptions come along there are different sorts but we're clearly in a disruption now and the question is is that where are you on this particular curve are you have you managed and I'm I've tried very hard to do a presentation without the word pivot in it I haven't succeeded yet but it is my uh, it's my aspiration to do so but nevertheless we, we have a pivot point for some people uh, whereby they're either going to carry on down the curve this way uh, sorry they're going to carry on down the curve this way or they're going to move to a new curve by changing what they do a very fortunate few who I've spoken to over recent times have managed to keep their business going simply by being very agile he says simply very skillfully being agile and actually moving their business on this is a peculiar type of disruption but it's a disruption nevertheless and it's a question of what you do and the reason I put this chart up is it is it is that thinking strategically thinking very carefully thinking critically about where you are is absolutely crucial um, at times like this and it's crucial and again some of you will have seen this 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 picture before in that times like this and other challenges put huge stress pressure and challenge on us uh, and part of how we respond to stress to pressure and to challenges is how you actually think things through um, and and actually putting some structure around your thinking is critically important sometimes in thinking we'll want to move in different directions and the directions we can go in are that we may change our business model we may move to serve more customer segments or different customer segments we may move to look very hard at what our revenue is doing and what our costs are doing and we might try and do substantial areas around there that's called disruptive innovation or we might go for wholeness bolus change and really radically change everything that we do in our business or life and we'll end up with some form of radical innovation so the saying goes you know that the, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago and the second best time is now what i want people to do is to start planting their own forest and to start thinking about how are we going to do that and how are we going to get through and get by who inspires me where is all where is my thinking my critical thinking which has led to this where has that actually come from and it's come from these people and others but these are the main influences on me um, Linda Grattan at the London Business School working with Andrew Scott has been writing on changes in work life well, probably for 20 years now I know that she started a project when I was at Cambridge because a colleague of mine at Cambridge worked with her on this project around what work life was going to do most recently she's forecasting where work life is going uh, and she's talking about a hundred year life meaning we have an 80 year work life so just contemplate that for a moment what that actually means Blue Ocean Strategy, uh, Chan Kim and Renny Morborn from INSEAD changed the way we think about strategy completely. Tim Brown bought 
change by design into the business vocabulary. Robert Clatton, David Norton did a heck of a lot around what's called the balance scorecard, but more importantly for me, they produced this work called Strategy Maps. How do you operationalize all of this great thinking that you're doing? You can use a strategy map to do that. Matt Church talks about the need for to evolve leadership to meet the times that we're facing uh, in his work on Rise Up. And Bern Harnish talks about how we can scale businesses up. Then in terms of business modeling yourself and business modeling your uh, business, there's the work of um, Alex Osterwalder, Yves Pinheur, and uh, Tim Clark in those two important books there. And then in this particular workshop, I'm greatly influenced by um, Peter Chefland, who I was very fortunate to be taught by Peter at, Les at Lancaster University uh, on soft systems methodology. Peter is now, I think he's about 100 years old and he's still going strong, still writing, so good on him. Um, still writes fascinating work on this whole idea. We'll talk about that in a moment. And the work of Jason Dyer on critical thinking on how you... I have other influences, but it's important to acknowledge that these are the people who played a main role in what I'm talking about this morning. So strategic thinking back onto kind of the main course now. It's really, it's really knowing about how to critically assess problematic situations in your business organisation, social organisations or life that come from challenges in your operating context, in the world that you live in. And, and the metaphor I love to use here is it's all about releasing your inner Sherlock. What do you deduce, he nearly said deduce, deduce from the environment that you're in? What, what is it going to tell you? What, what does logic and some subjective leap? And, and Holmes was the great one for apparent subjective leaps, but nevertheless, he made them. Um, and nevertheless, that's what we want to see, more deductive, more careful thinking. That said, thinking occasionally is, um, and I've referred to it earlier, sometimes looks like magic. And um, my first business school, uh, David Weir, related to me a story um, when he was um, just after he graduated and he was working with an entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur asked him to get information on this potential takeover case. Um, and the, the takeover, uh, he brought reams and reams of documents to this entrepreneur. And after about three or four days, the entrepreneur said, okay, let's get on with it, we're gonna do this. And David said, but you haven't, read all of the, you haven't read all of the information yet. He said, no, but I've read enough. And that was where the magic happened. He'd, he'd put together the things he thought it through, he'd seen enough data, and away we went. So that is, um, that's what it's about. Improved strategic thinking, leading to improved personal and professional performance and improved business performance. I'm just gonna to turn to a question uh, from Samir on Blue Ocean Strategy. Um, and when the article in HBR originally talked mainly around two case studies, um, one of them, Cirque du Soleil, is, uh, is, is not defunct yet. Cirque du Soleil has gone into bankruptcy protection um, at the moment, and they're looking to see if they can restructure. Would you like your view? Is and the, but Smear's question is: Is Blue Ocean Strategy being oversold? Um, for me, no. Um, uh, Blue Ocean Strategy is just a very, is just a different approach. And the idea with Blue Ocean Strategy is it is not a um, it's not conventional strategy. So what it does, the most the most important element of Blue Ocean Strategy is it focuses on customer value. And that, that's the key differentiating thing. It, it's not, it's less worried about the market, which if you like the Harvard Design School, the classic strategy uh, modeling approach is built around um, looking carefully at the, at the market, looking carefully at political things. But Blue Ocean Strategy is much more organic, much faster moving than that because it focuses on the business model that you are running and the um, the people you are serving and what value you're creating. So no, I don't think it's been oversold. I think there are, to answer your question, um, um, and 
it's it's really why and, and Samir's given the solution I was, <laughs> you got ahead of me then Samir <laughs> It is about really how you differentiate, and that's the core thing that it goes on. Because the older model, if you go and look at the work of Porter, um, who, who was the one who created a lot of the Harvard Design School thinking, Porter only really talks about three types of uh, strategy, and there are many more types of strategy than that. But that's because strat um, Porter has an old fashioned view. I mean, I wish I'd sold as many books as Michael Porter, but he has an old fashioned view of strategy, a, a different view of strategy. So uh, I think that's a great question. Thank you for that, Samir. I'll um, go back to the uh, where we are. So my point is that um, strategic thinking for transformation um, is, isn't magical because most magic is illusion. And I think that there are four main elements to strategic thinking and a couple of methods you can use. And the four main elements are good critical assessment. That's what we need, good critical assessment. Looking at organisational or other problems. You can use this approach to address issues and challenges in your own life, in your own leadership style and in your own business. But I talk in organisational uh, context. And it also looks at environmental challenges. So this is back to the, um, as Alec has said, this was back to the, the strategy for the times that the Michael Porters and the Clayton Christiansons of the world is looking at challenges coming from environments such as we have now. But what environmental challenges tend to do, as Cirque du Soleil have just found out, is environmental challenges tend to reveal fundamental organisational problems because they, they sort of shine a, a spotlight on the organization and that's what produces um, the sort of the, the problems that we're seeing but getting your head around those by doing a critical assessment of those two areas you actually begin to develop a transformational roadmap and that that'll be something that i'll come to uh, in another workshop later in the series um, and all i'm advocating for is to use some form of structured approach to thinking and I'll just lay out my, the ideas of uh, critical thinking and of, um, of soft, system, soft systems methodology, he hastened to uh, correct, um, around how you can actually put some structure on thinking and work things through. As I work through this, what, I'm not, what, I, what I don't want to uh, talk about is, is exhaustive, uh, deep, 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 deep thinking you know um what what some people call paralysis through analysis what i'm saying is to put a light structure a light framework over what you're facing and actually give you a structure to work from and how you can actually improve things and it, it's it's really about it what it's about is the, the question is were you ever thought taught to think it's a bit like you know um a lot of folk um, weren't taught to learn and a lot of people aren't taught to think if you're fortunate to have done a course on philosophy or um, and this is not a political point or an arts degree <laughs> uh, that involves doing some form of criticism the chances are you may not have been um, taught to think in a structured manner um, or the, there's an argument about university education which which is it, it teaches you to think some of it does some of it doesn't it depends on the discipline that you're in although a university education is always very good sometimes he said and the distinction i want to draw is that picture here of this young lady she's meditating quite clearly to to clear her brain to give herself an empty brain to work or she's possibly in a mindfulness meditation where she's wanting to make sure that she's fully present in the here and now now, my advice to you, um, uh, uh, my friends, is if you get the chance to learn mindfulness, do so. It's a vital technique and helps you to concentrate at work like nothing else. It's, it's one of the greatest things I've come across in the past few years where I've been involved in it. What thinking is, is it takes this to the next level, and that is thinking should be conscious and deep as far as possible uh, in particular situations. 
what I want you to think about as I just walk through uh, the next uh, few ideas is to think where, um, where are you now? Where do you want to be? And what is it you need to do to get there? So three, three things for you uh, to think about. So strategic thinking for transformation is about knowing how to critically assess organizational problem situations or personal or, or leadership situations that come from some form of challenge in the environment and then allows you to get to a transformational roadmap. Uh, now, leadership thinking for uh, strategic transformation, when you're talking in an organizational context, should really be um, how do you produce team-based outcomes that prescribe uh, the transformation you want? How can you do a form of conceptual mapping, uh, modeling that allows you to develop maps? And um, how do you apply systematic methods to help you actually get towards a sensible future? And the methods I use when I'm doing this sort of thinking, and I do use them, are critical uh, thinking, particularly critical thinking. And sometimes in a complex situation, a more complex situation where I need to think more clearly, I'll use soft systems methodology. I'm gonna talk about those in a moment. Critical thinking does work. I, I in, in a, a video that you might've seen that, that, that talks about this, I, I use this example and that's Netflix. And their CEO, uh, Reed Hastings in 2013, obviously did some deep critical thinking and he, and he put out a new strategy and he wanted to move from being uh, a digital content provider to being a producer of original content content and we've also we've all seen the effect of that i was watching some of its effects last night the memo that he sent out to staff when he did that was that he said we can't we don't can't compete on a breath with a whole list of competitors um, Amazon, Sky, Apple, Microsoft, Sony, Google. We can't do that. You need to be much more focused on, on what he calls a passion brand. Things like Starbucks um, rather than 7-Eleven, um, Southwest Night. So he's talking about niche brands that do things really well rather than larger commercial brands uh, which have a different approach. And it worked. And this is what you get when you think critically about your business. Um, by 2019, from that date, 2013, they've tripled their revenue. Um, their profits have multiplied about 32 times over. Uh, and this is before, of course, the, um, <coughs> the great singularity or the, or the great reset, as, as uh, a colleague called it the other day. Its stock uh, returned had gone up 57% annually uh, versus 11% for the S&P 500. So, Critical thinking does work. So let's just talk very briefly um, about some aspects of how you approach it. This is kind of, um, this is critical thinking in a nutshell. This is the approach I, I uh, use when I look at it. And what it's about, it's the capacity to think plainly and reasonably and understand the association between the thoughts that you're having. Um, what you're doing is you're trying to take part in intelligent and autonomous reasoning uh, in your head and you, you've got to use your capacity so it's actually not the way the brain normally works when it's making decisions and thinking is is semi semi autonomously so the way our mental models are set up in our heads is is that we learn a system of heuristics it's our own operating system some of it runs automatically so it's what keeps our heart, hearts beating and blood pumping and whatever, and vision and voice working. Some of it requires us to actually, some of it requires more work, more capacity. So um, it's about utilizing your capacity to reason, as I say. And it, it's almost, uh, and I love this expression, it's about being a functioning student, a functioning student as opposed to being a, a semi-disconnected Beneficiary of data, so a great expression that I picked up the other day um, from somebody. But it's how you question thoughts and presumptions 
instead of just tolerating them. So it's actually interrogating what's gone on. Um, and if you decide that those thoughts, contentions or discoveries, um, do they speak to the whole picture? Is it informing what you see or is it not informing what you see? And, and really the way that we do this is, um, it's almost a variation of, of the six honest servants, as I call them. Uh, when you actually look at somebody's position on something um, or, or somebody's uh, attempted um, goal, what is it you're trying to do when you assess that position? Who said it? What did they say? Where did they say it? And when did they say it? And then the, crew, the key question is, for what reason did they say that? In other words, why did they say that? And how could they say that? So you're constantly digging in deeper into what people said. So it's really just putting a structure over interrogating normality is the way that we're actually looking at this. Um, if we actually look at it in application, for example, a construction company has to identify all the potential hazards on a building site to ensure its employees are working safely as possible. That's normal health and safety practice. Now, without that analysis, you could get injuries or deaths causing dis, you know, distress, causing issues with the workforce and impacting the company's reputation. In other words, you've got to think it through. That sounds an obvious example but some people do not think through their actions. Just look at some of the cases we see in the courts at the moment. They're not thinking through what it is they're doing. A no finer example in recent times over the last few years than the finance industries. They've got to think about the impacts of the new legislation on the way they work. They've got to think about how new laws will impact their clients. And you, you've got to start to think around how you're going to do that. Now, how we actually do that, what do you actually need to do that? These are the skills we see in critical thinking. And there are three central things that these cover off. It's, it's looking to adopt more data and looking for proof, just as being available to new thoughts. It's about awareness in that your interrogation position is solid enough to actually work with the data. And then you have to be within yourself and that's why i put the picture up of the mindful meditation earlier you've actually got to sit and think that through so we're combining all of these skills that we see here right the way around um, in actually developing what we're thinking our perception of in environment that's where mindfulness comes in actually enabling us to um, actually enabling us to sit in an environment and listen Investigation skills, which, which I've written on with a, with a friend of mine, um, are, are important. How do we actually get the information that we want? Elucidation, understanding that information and then reflecting on it to learn from the information, start to reflect on that. Then to assess and derive meaning from it, but also going backwards and forwards in forms of clarification. And what it is, is it's, it's this explicit thinking. And if you're me, I know I'm thinking explicitly if I'm talking to myself. Now, that's not just about getting the, the right answers to the, or the dog, but it, it's about explicitly thinking things through. Um, if I'm thinking things through, often as not, I will go for a walk and talk to myself about what it is. Or I might get on a whiteboard if something is particularly complex and asking those crucial questions. And this is a basic, a basic element of leadership that I'm actually talking about here. Um, now, why is this important? It's important that we do this because this is really, this, this whole thing here, sorry, this whole thing here, when we start to talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning, it's these skills that are the things that for a long time to come, distinguish human ability from um, AI ability. AI can do some of this, but, but not as well as we can. It simply doesn't have the flexibility yet. Uh, what gives me the right to say that? I used to work in artificial intelligence and I still keep up to it. What this, the, the great part about AI is, is that we can use these skills, the critical 
thinking skills to augment the intelligence we get out of artificial intelligence systems. The example is in accounting. Sorry, if, uh, I don't know if any of you are accountants, but a lot of accounting now um, is online and a lot of the bookkeeping work can be done and indeed is done through artificial intelligence systems, through uh, crawlers, web crawlers, web browsers, um, robotic systems. Um, but, and, and so we can, you know, I mean, even I, a, a, an accounting, not particularly strong in accounting, I can do it. But even I, with assistance, can produce profit and loss statements, prepare accounts and invoices, all governed through technology. What I can't do is interpret the data as strongly as a qualified accountant or someone in finance because I don't have their critical thinking skills in their space. I can ask the questions, but no way have I got the skill level of a, of a, of a, um, a CPA or a CA in that space. And so it's this ability using these skills to analyze large amounts of information and draw conclusions on them um, that enable you to make decisions. That's what critical thinking gives us. And we, my argument here in strategic thinking is it, it just needs to be more structured. Now that's a very basic approach that you can take and it's one that most people will recognize and use. <clears throat> a, much more, um, uh, a, a much stronger approach, if you like, uh, a, more, uh, a more theoretically informed approach is what's called soft systems methodology. And this came out of uh, Lancaster University in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, Peter Checkland was the man who led its development. You can go and look, you can go and look Peter's work up. And it's still used to this day, it's used extensively in the analysis of complex situations where there are lots of different views about what the problem is and how you can actually get a solution. And so uh, it's once, if you get a better understanding of a system, even if there's still this agreement, you've got a better chance to get a good debate running and you've got a better chance to find a solution that can work for most people. The model I've just put up here is, is, the, is the classic uh, situation. Um, it's, it's basically an applied consulting model. That's the way Checkland has always worked. And that is you go into a problematic situation, you try and get a description of what that situation is that most people can agree on. And you try and get what they call a root definition. I'll come to that in just a moment which is, is the glorious acronym of CAT WOE, not CAT something else. Um, but that, give, but that, that's, that um, mnemonic gives a, uh, a common framework that you can actually draw uh, systems from. You build a conceptual model of how it's going to might work. You compare the models with the real world, and that gives you a basis for a, a, a solution. Now, People have come along and changed this around um, and trying to give this a grand philosophical bent and to draw all sorts of fancy pictures of how the world is. But um, in reality, um, if you just do this, you will, it, it'll be helpful to get um, good solutions to problems. And it's this earlier view that I use. And the best way to draw that earlier view that I know is to simply think about these ideas. And that is, um, look at the customers. Who are the beneficiaries of, of this whole process that you're looking at? And how does the issue affect them? Who's involved in the situation? And who's gonna be involved in implementing solutions and what will impact their success? In other words, who are the actors? what is the transformation that you're looking at because we're looking at a process that's transformational process what is it that's happening uh, grapes to wine my son was talking about working with treasury wine estates this morning that's why that comes to mind uh, you know moving from a uh, stock in your stock room to developing a car or, or a computer um, actually making uh, creating a new economic purpose for Australia, let's do a grand one, why not? But some form of process has taken off. 
then look at what the big picture is now to me whenever i do this sort of work um this is always where the contention lies because very often worldview gets caught up with politics and it's important to try and stay away from that by really trying to put a relatively objective worldview into place then you need to think about who the owner is who owns the process or the situation and what role are they going to play in the solution and then really what are the constraints and i always come back to constraints i talked about it last time i talked about it a lot um, constraint theory is very important because if you work on solving constraints in a system that's how you get your solution and you should work on one constraint at a time and then the next one and the next one and the next one at the next one because you just, if you solve one thing almost as completely as you can at once you get very rapid evolution of a working solution to any system and here's an example this is actually um, this is from this is a fairly old picture as you can see i just picked it up um, uh, out of a, a piece of work i've used previously um, we can see that this is what is called in the jargon a rich picture this is actually the um a sugar mill i don't can't recall where it is but it's a sugar mill i think uh, somewhere uh, in uh, possibly uh, the west indies or maybe even australia but the basic idea is that um, the thing that is most important to everybody uh, here is um, is the mill is at the heart of the system and um, you want to have a reliable cane supply which is what um, causes issues the big problem in all of this is the weather so we can see the weather there so we're immediately starting to see um, the advent of who's happening the customers of the mill are the small scale growers the actors within you have the people who run the mill and uh, the growers themselves again you've got the shareholders who've got an interest and the transformation is how you move sugar uh, from being cane into actually being sugar the world view is this whole picture what's going on in government there's a there's a political view there are competing mills how can you make this mill more successful um and the um sorry i've just got it's gone straight out of my head i'm going to flip back the owner sorry the owner um of this whole process is the person who runs the mill and then this is part of the environment straight away you've got a very simple picture of the dynamics in this um in this whole organization and you can begin to start to think about where you can start to play with different elements where your money is best spent how do you get to best you start to ask questions you have a structure that's literally all you need to do to actually start on having a more structured thinking process and sometimes organizations simply don't think that way i can give you more examples if um, if you're interested so that's so structured um strategic thinking for transformation what is it about it's it's about making a critical assessment of organizational problems and environmental challenges usually that produce organizational problems that give you some form of transformational road trip uh, sorry transformational roadmap how do you actually are you going to change things and you actually should follow some form of structured process this is part and this is very brief and i make no apologies for doing this is part of a new transforming leaders and mentoring program that I've got going on at the moment. If you're interested, that's the place to go and look at that. But more, I hope more interestingly for you, there are another um, six, there are another six workshops in this series that cover different aspects of strategic management, and you can go and look them up in uh, my LinkedIn website. The most important thing in all of this, and, and Einstein is always is somebody who is overquoted, but why not? and that is that you can't solve your problems with the same thinking that you used when we created them so it's just a different way of um, approaching um, uh, thinking that i'm calling for in strategic systems 
So um, you've probably worked out that that's me and that's what I look like, but that's where you can get hold of me if you want to, uh, if you want to find out more, um, more thinking on this particular subject. So that's all I've got. I just wanted to run through that. Um, and if um, I'll make sure the notes come through to you, I'll, I'll follow up on um, everybody who's been involved um, with you um, and, uh, and make sure you get those. And as I say, this will be available. So over to you, if you've got anything you, um, if you want to have, um, uh, okay. You've touched upon singularity and reset. I'd like to know more about this from Samia. The singularity that I talk about is, is the obvious one that occurred probably sometime in late December last year um, in, um, in a, probably, the signs are, that probably in a, a, a live food market in Wuhan. Somebody ate something which then transformed into a, a form of respiratory disease, which then spread like wildfire through the population of China and with with us being a hyper connected world then spread um then spread pretty much everywhere um more forward looking governments let's put it that way um and um and this is not a political statement <laughs> more forward looking governments worldwide very quickly shut down their borders very quickly they realized they saw what was coming uh jacinda arden in, in new zealand it's a particular case and, and to his credit I don't agree with everything that Scott Morrison does, but to his credit, Scott Morrison made a pretty decent fist of the whole thing with his government. Not perfect, but not, not bad. There'll be huge debates around what, what he's gonna do now, but I don't care about that. Um, and then everything changed. Um, my business changed dramatically. I would have been going into the city to talk with people two or three times a week. Um, I think yesterday was the first day I've been out in an age to go and talk with somebody. Um, and I am moving slowly online. Where my business is going is going towards a um, really helping people develop, delivering courses, but increasingly help, helping people to develop their own training courses and also providing uh, course material for people. That, that's really where I'm moving towards. That's my particular expertise set. Lots of people have done. By singularity, I mean it is a singular event that has caused so much change. Reset has caused so much change. So many industries have changed. Um, the airline industry is a case in point. The airline industry has changed dramatically um, uh, over the past um, few uh, months, as we know. So that's why we say, and I think you will see a reset in the way a lot of some people will carry on their business they, the way they've always done business because nothing's changed for them. Other people will change dramatically and they'll tend to move things online. But that's what I think. Another question, will the rule book be thrown out with COVID-19? I'm not sure which rule book you're talking about, Ali, but um, I think some, some of the rules of engagement and how we do business are, are going to change. And I'm not talking about bumping elbows and bumping fists instead of shaking hands or whatever. But I think that a lot of people are having to move very quickly to adapt their business models to a very different environment. The two great, sorry, the two largest examples of that, they're not great examples of that in Australia, are education, which is my, my business where I sit. Education, I don't think will ever be the same again. I, ju I just can't see it ever being the same again. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that we will recover to the huge volumes of international students moving not just to Australia, but worldwide. I don't think we'll ever see that. Um, what I think is that, and, and Alec is, is predicting my next statement, I think we'll see ourselves turn inward more. I think globalisa globalisation will pull back. There's a great book many years ago by um, an Oxford academic um, Gray, I can't remember his surname, his, his, his surname but he talked about um, the dawn of globalisation as being, um, um, he wasn't overly optimistic. And I think looking back, he's, he's probably, well, I don't know if he's still alive, but he's probably still contemplating that. I think we've got to be careful. What I'm seeing is that we are seeing a rise of nationalism in some, <coughs> in some countries. 
And I think we've got to be careful about that. Yes, we do have to look after the countries that we live in. I'm a New Zealander, but I live in Australia. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here and help out where I can. But I think we've got to be careful of that. I think we've got to go back to a form of cautious globalisation, is how I would put it, until we get a handle on how we can, <clears throat> on how we can better manage these sorts of pandemics. There's another one brewing, if you, if you believe Nine News, which is often a difficult thing to do uh, in terms of, of swine flu. I, we're not there yet with that one, but, but we've got to be very careful. So yes, I think we will be more insular for a while. I think it will take somewhere between four to five years for this to turn out. And then we'll start to build, the world will start to build again. I think it'll be a decade before the world recovers completely, at least. Anybody want to ask anything else? And by the way, you can, uh, you can always drop me a line if you want to ask anything. Um, and, uh, and I'm quite happy to respond that way. <coughs> um, <laughs> reliance on manufacturing, that's interesting. There's a really interesting book by um, Andrew Livers, who is the chairman of um, Dow Chemicals, who's an Australian who was born in Darwin. And he's he wrote about this about 10 years ago now. And he was talking about America. And he was saying how America needs to get back to having a manufacturing base. Um, and I am utterly convinced I was writing on it um, the other day, actually, to uh, a, a friend over in uh, Western Australia. Australia's got to find it. It's got, Australia has manufacturing, let's be really clear but it's got to find its way back to having more scale manufacturing than it has at the moment. Yes, there will be, you will always need mass manufacturing that is done um, through cheaper means, but there's got to be some form of contract has got to be done between the owners of capital and labor. Um, um, and if you want a recipe for, I think, where the Australian economy needs to evolve towards to cope with this great reset, I still can't get past, and this is a cliche, you can't go past Germany in terms of, of an economy that actually works. It's not a socialist market, market economy, it's a social market economy. But the core of that economy is uh, this, this backbone of family-owned manufacturing firm. And I think that's where we need to try and go. China, yes, I... I it, is it will always be an issue um, and who knows where that's going to end up. I think India will, will mature, but it'll take a long time to mature. Um, I was chatting with, with a friend yesterday and we were contemplating that 20 million Indians um, become 18 every year. So something's got to happen in that country <laughs> in terms of, so, um, uh, We'll see where we go. Are there any more, uh, anybody, any more questions? I'm conscious of time. That's a great comment, Michael. I could not agree more. I could not agree more. Uh, Michael, as you can all see. It, we've got to look at it at as a sustainable in all the meanings in all meanings of that word we have to look at a sustainable model for humans and and we we, we there's got to be some form of rethink of economic models i am by no means am i a, a raging a socialist or raging lefty never have been never will be but I, it occurs to me that the, the principle of laissez-faire economics, I was writing on this the other day, ain't going to work. It's not going to cut it. And we've really got to think ab about how we can actually build a stronger economy that's good for, for a much larger majority than it is at the moment. And um, some of us are very privileged. So yes, Michael, I couldn't agree more. We've got to think more, much more about economic. The economic models that dominate are just, uh, just not working. Um, how will COVID impact on the fourth industrial revolution? Um, if anything, I think, but the fourth industrial revolution, you're, you're, I think you're talking about the, um, 
you're talking about the advance of artificial intelligence and, and technology more broadly into all aspects of life. I think it's going to accelerate it. It's certainly going to accelerate it in education, which is my interest area in, in educational technology. We're going to see more of that. I mean, we, uh, my, my wife works in education and we were chatting that they now have, um, they're now having exams, for example, are being uh, invigilated by an online um, proctoring system, um, which is quite interesting. I mean, I can still remember doing an exam and having somebody wandering around in a, in a gown invigilating what I was doing a long time ago. Um, education more online, I think we'll see. Uh, here's, here's an interesting one. My sister is a, a company director now, professional director in the UK. And um, the three or four businesses that she uh, acts as a director for are probably going to only hold one face-to-face -face meeting a year now. They've almost certainly going to move to uh, much more online meetings. So it's, it's, it's those subtle shifts um, that I think we'll see. So I think it's going to accelerate it. <clears throat> if we get, if the waves keep coming until we get uh, some form of um, inoculation against this, I think it's just going to keep accelerating it. It's kind of like Moore's law for, um, for, the, for computer power. Um, it, it's going to have to do that. The biggest thing is going to be, uh, the the way it's impacted airlines as well is that's going to drive an awful lot because people there's no long you're not for a, quite some time you're not going to have the convenience of travel that we've enjoyed for the last 15 years or so how to bring stakeholders in education to buy your strategic thinking plan stick to that some planning thinking what not <laughs> That's a great question there, um, Spice. How do you get um, how do you get stakeholders into education to buy strategic thinking and strict to the agreed plan? Sometimes planning and thinking is one thing, operational quality assurance for another. That is always Spice. That is always the great challenge of implementation. Um, there's an old expression which I used last week, I think, when I talked about this, and that is that um, plans survive right up until the point that you engage with the enemy. That is that that's what you're talking about is a grand challenge there. And it's the challenge of leadership. It's how you actually communicate and keep the people on side. Um, quality assurance will always be an issue because a little bit like emergency planning. Okay, you don't, in a sense, need quality assurance until things go wrong. And I don't mean to any disrespect to people working in QA there, but you only find the value of quality assurance when something is incorrect. It's like disaster and emergency planning. People always cut it back and, and then suddenly they find that they need it. So what you've asked there is how do you get stakeholders <clears throat> to buy into planning? How do you get stakeholders to stick to the plan? Uh, and how do you, it's about leadership. Um, and that's that's the idea of the, this whole series of talks is about transformational leadership. And yes, COVID will has changed what I value, so it's almost certainly changed what everybody else values. Everybody, look, thank you so much for your the generosity of your time and staying with me. Uh, a couple of our, our friends have left already, which I understand, <coughs> um, which um, which I understand. This, um, this whole uh, webinar is, has been recorded and it will be, uh, it'll be converted and I'll send the link out to you directly and then eventually I'll get it up and run on my website. Always a pleasure. And, and, and again, yes, Sonia, great, great questions. Um, and there will be a, another one um, over the next week. Uh, ne next week, same uh, as the saying used to go, and it, I'll show my age here. Same bat time, same bat channel <coughs> next week. So thank you so much.